Welcome back to the Beyond the Buckets. Exciting guest today. Vance Rouse, welcome to the program, man. Hey, thanks, Chris. Good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. You are uniquely positioned to be on a show like this because you have many buckets in your life. Uh, you know, we're, we're definitely going to talk some of the Seattle hoop scene. Uh, we're yep. going to talk about the uh, the church that you co-founded, uh, Vibe Church, as well as some of the startups that you work for and, and, and that you that you began and, and, and founded. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Man, likewise, man. That, that, yeah, that is a, a good amount of buckets. Um, just just falling in the footsteps of people like you and uh, excited to, to be having this conversation on this podcast. Good. Well, I want to start it off with the uh, Seattle hoop scene. For those that don't know, you were from Seattle. You're yeah. a big hoops fan as well. You played with and against a lot of really good players at the college yeah. and the professional level. So uh, tell me about the Seattle hoop scene because uh, I think it gets slept on. The Bay Area, people know about, you know, Jason Kidd and, and wow. Gary Payton who used to play in Seattle and, you know, all the, all the female hoopers that have come out of the area. But uh, tell me about the Seattle hoop scene. Yo, you can't sleep on Seattle, man. Like, no, no puns intended in that. I mean, like, seriously, the Seattle hoop scene is, is pretty dope and it's produced a lot of pretty amazing players in the past decade or so. Uh, anybody that's from Seattle would know this, but people like Brandon Roy, who probably had a, you know, way too short of a career, right? We had people like Nate Robb, um, Isaiah Thomas, who I got a chance to, to play with. Um, shout out to him. I, I played with him in a summer league game. I was guarding him. I thought I locked him up, but then I checked the box score afterward and he's going to be five. It was the quietest 35. Oh man. <laughs> Um, that that I've ever experienced, but you just could tell that these guys were NBA level talent. Jamal Crawford, I mean, the list goes on with how many people from high schools like Garfield and Rainier Beach that was produced from Seattle. So a really lively scene out there, which is crazy because it's like it's raining a ton, um, but a lot of good like indoor rec scenes. And the University of Washington has been putting together pretty solid squads for for the last decade. Yeah, you dub. They got the uh, they got the coach from Syracuse, right? They switched it all up and they go on all zone. They got a bunch of length on the backside. Uh, yep. So, and you went to U Dub, right? I did. I did. Yeah, we had some fun years, man. We had some fun years. We, so, uh, tell we had... me about your time there. <clears throat> man, the University of Washington, first and foremost, is a is a beautiful campus. Uh, but specifically, my favorite part of the University of Washington. We're talking about hoop right now. So it was called the IMA, the Intramurals Athletic Center. I spent like three hours a day at that joint and we would actually hoop in the off seasons, especially against people like Terrence Ross that were, were playing for the team at that time. And, you know, the, the, the team would actually frequent the IMA and just hoop against us. And you know that feeling when you watch and hoopers would know this, like, uh, or actually, especially non-hoopers might not know this, but you, you watch on TV college basketball or even NBA, and you might think, oh, certain players, right? Like, oh, they're, they're not that good. Like, <laughs> you know, like they're, sure. good, they're not that good. But any NBA player, you see them like during a, just an open, open gym, open run, they don't miss. They, they don't they're, miss. They're, they're, they're the most elite, like they don't miss. And that even carries to D1 college too. Right. Like even the bench players, right? Like they don't, they don't miss. They're like, they're lights out. Right. Right. And I tell my high school kids this all the time. You got to be shooting when nobody's guarding you. You got to be making 70, 75% of your shots because yeah. it's your shooting percentage is going to decrease probably by 30, 40 points. So if you can't make an outside shot with nobody guarding you a 75% clip, well, you probably need to be working on your game more because to your point, these players don't miss, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, they'll go nine for 10 from a spot. If they're shooting 10 at, or they're shooting 20 at a spot, they're going nine for 10 every time, you yep. know, and uh, it'll be rare when they miss. Like, you know, Gilbert Arenas, he has a podcast too called No, no Chill Gil. Um, yep. He's got to, he's got to pay us an endorsement for that uh, shout out, but um <laughs> He, he made like 99 out of 100, you know, yeah. and, and he did that, you know, within the past couple of years. Uh, and he just, and he, and he showed it or 95. It was, it was some crazy number. 
Shout out to Gilbert Arenas, one of the most prolific scorers at his prime, man. Right. The career was way too short. He was phenomenal. And if you think about it now, if he was playing now, he would be much better suited to the way that the league is with the lead guard being a scorer. You know, he was in that, he was in that 2000s, the early, you know, the whole 2000s, right before the 2010s came in. But that whole early 2000s is a very difficult because you still had the big man and you still had to try to get that. But he was a scoring guard and he was, he was really good. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Who's the best player you played against or with or, you know, just seen? Uh, So who went to my high school, he was a senior when we were coming in as freshmen, was Rodney Stuckey. So uh, that specifically was like the closest to our hometown, probably one of the top players that came from our hometown of Kent, a suburb of Seattle. Sure. I would say the best player that I played against, I mentioned him earlier, Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. Like just for his size – uh, the ability for him to just dominate. Yeah. Right? I remember a game where I was watching him at the state level, um, the state tournament, play against Vinoy Overton, right? Vinoy Overton at Franklin, and, uh, and Isaiah Thomas was playing against him. And Isaiah, so Vinoy Overton, when he played for University of Washington, and they made the Sweet 16, I believe. Mm-hmm was considered one of the best defensive players in the league that year in the NCAA. Sure. But when Vinoy was locking up uh, or trying to lock up Isaiah Thomas in that state tournament, Isaiah put 53 on him. Oh, wow. 53. Wow. On guy you, that was you, saw, you saw it? I saw it, bro. Like, it was just unreal. This guy had hang time. He had the confidence, right? When, when I played against him, he would – he would release from like NBA three. Yeah. And, and as he released, he would already turn around, be walking back. Yeah. And he would be like, just commenting. Oh yeah. And like, he just knew it was buckets. Right. It yeah. It's uh, he's, he's, he's an interesting player. And uh, to score 53 in high school with eight minute quarters, this is, it's a, that's a real feat too. A so feat. Uh, yeah. Shout out Isaiah Thomas. I hope he gets back uh, on his feet as far as his I, know. Career. I know he's still in the league. But uh, it would be nice to see him because, you know, the little guys, they always have a, they always got that chip on their shoulder. But uh, he was definitely is a great player and, and obviously was. So yep. uh, switching a little bit. Um, tell me a little bit about your you have a business uh, business background. Yeah. And uh, you moved out to the Bay Area and started working for some startups. You also work for Google at, yep. a, at a period of time. So tell me about your process from uh, finishing college to coming to the Bay Area and just dabbling and all that the technology world has here yeah man it's been it's been a trip it's been a it's been an incredible decade my wife and I we got married literally right after graduation and what brought us to the bay was our careers right I got a job offer at Google by the grace of God my wife got a job teaching in San Jose through a program called Teach for America so that brought us to San Jose and when we got down here I mean Seattle has a pretty good tech scene but the scene here in the Silicon Valley is unprecedented, right? Like it's, it's crazy. And I remember first going into Google and the first thing was just recognizing just the, just like the perks, right? <laughs> like, like literally, you know, the culture, the company culture, yeah. uh, you know, and those, those benefits and perks that the Valley has kind of pioneered has been really, really cool. Uh, just the level of generosity that, they pour out into their employees uh, was cool to experience. And then from there, um, after a couple years at Google, I got recruited to lead product at a data technology company called Adara. Okay. Did some, you know, entrepreneurial things here and there alongside, I think another thing that we're going to talk about, uh, us starting a church. Yeah. Um, but it's been awesome, man, just to see the innovation. I think the biggest thing that you'll find if you come to the Silicon Valley is this level of optimi- optimism, mm-hmm. right? That there's no limits, right? Right. I-, I think that no limit type mentality with people, like that, that they-, they see a problem, they see an obstacle, and that's exciting to people here because sure. they know that through technology, through innovation, we can overcome those obstacles. We can make it more efficient, more convenient. We can serve people better. That, that is infectious here. And that's why, 
you know, probably what music producing is to Nashville is what yeah. startups is to the Silicon Valley, right? Like everybody's doing a startup or something entrepreneurial, right? Everybody got a side hustle here in the Valley. For sure, for sure. Tell me how, did you know the path that you wanted to go on? Did you know you wanted to get into technology as soon as you graduated? Uh, and what was it like getting your foot in the door for the first time? So yeah. many young people, when they, when they finish college, they don't really know exactly what they want to do, right? So it's, it's very difficult for them. You know, I may have a degree in psychology or I may have a degree in sociology or business and they have no clue on how to, to go into their next field. So how did yeah. you determine what you wanted to do? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, maybe I can give my perspective that might be helpful to some young people, especially high schoolers, college students that are going through this process. When I was at the University of Washington, I studied business. And so one thing that's interesting, especially in the track that I was on, is everything was about management, consulting, and accounting at my school. Yeah. So it was propaganda, right? Um, it was, hey, you can make this type of income, you can travel like this, you can have this type of lifestyle if you work for one of the big consulting firms or one of the big accounting firms. And right. so it was almost like I was conditioned to think that's exactly what I want to do, yeah. you know? Um, and really the factors that led to that was really just monetary factors and lifestyle factors, right? That'd be cool. That'd be dope to travel and to make, you know, X amount of money. Right, I can make six figures by X amount of years if I do this career path. Um, the right. only thing that kind of broke through that deviated me from that pathway, because all my internships were in consulting, sure. was this one recruiter from Google, probably the only recruiter that ever went to the University of Washington during that time period, that talked about the culture at Google, that talked about the culture in the Silicon Valley, that really opened my eyes to potentially a different pathway Right. that I could take, right? And so in talking to him and fortunately getting an offer from Google, I was comparing these offers that were in front of me, these opportunities that were in front of me. And it was interesting because the management consulting route was much more in the short term, I guess, lucrative, right? The offer letters were a magnitude more than what Google wanted to offer. Sure. And I really had to kind of like think about it. Uh, I'm really guided by my faith, so pray about it talk to some wise counsel about it. And what I came to was not just following the money, right? And the perceived lifestyle, but really following what I thought I would enjoy, but also where I thought I can learn and grow. Sure. And that's why I chose Google because I thought that the, the opportunity while in the short term wasn't as lucrative in the long term, the learning curve and the growth curve and the way that they were innovating, I would get so much more from that experience. And I'm so happy I chose that criteria to make my decision because it's now paid dividends. Um, and so if you use that criteria and you still are attracted to accounting, I think dope. I think it's just understanding what's your intent and what's the reasons for it. And if you are really self-aware about that, I think the decision that you make is gonna be much more sustainable. Wow, I love the perspective. And uh, obviously, when you when you make any decision based on your faith, and you really are faithful that, you know, I may be taking a hit, so to speak, right. in the short term, and then focusing on that long term vision and that goal, not that only just you have for yourself, but for what God has in store for you, and you yep. can live abundantly in that. I yes. just think that's so paramount for people to understand. Yeah, I could be making this amount of money, I could, you know, drive this kind of car, live in this kind of house. But is that going to be sustainable long, long term? And am I going to be enjoying what I'm doing? And if you're not growing to your earlier point, you're dying, you know, and, and a lot of people are not happy. A lot of people aren't happy with their jobs and, and what they do. Um, and, it, and it's obviously a paid real dividends like you mentioned so yeah. I'm, I'm happy that you went on that path and stepped out by faith and and did all of those things uh, so you stayed at google for a couple years uh what yeah. was your what was your next step after that yeah so that was another kind of inflection point in my career where i was learning a ton nothing wrong with google google is an amazing company but you start getting that itch and people know it if they're entrepreneurial where it's like okay I could stay here and life would be great, right? But if you got that itch, like, 
man, I can't not do it, then that's probably, that probably means that you should pursue that. You should follow that itch. Sure. Uh, and so I, I was just getting in this itch around wanting to start a company one day. Um, right. But I thought that a good interim step to that is joining an early stage startup to really understand what it takes sure. to start a startup, to grow a startup into a successful company. And so I was presented an opportunity. I was recruited from Google to lead product at a company called Adara, which is a data technology company, still going today, a really dope company. Uh, and I was really taken under the wing by the CTO and founder at that company and learned a ton about product and engineering from him. Got to build a few products within that company that ended up becoming really, really successful. Mm -hmm. uh, that allowed me to really accelerate in, in my learning of technology and building business and scaling business. Sure. So, so appreciative of that opportunity and, and everything that they're doing over there. Uh, but that was another, I guess the lesson in that again was it's like, it's that fear of faith step. Yeah. Right? And my pastor Hill says that fear and faith are in the realm of the unknown, right? Hmm. Yeah. Both of them live in the same space, right. right? Fear exists because something is uncertain or unknown, mm -hmm. but that's also why faith exists. So our opportunity is what we want to choose. Yep. Right? You want to choose fear or faith. And that inflection point in my career is the same type of thing with the Google thing. It was like, man, okay. I'm, I got this thing going that's like really comfortable and has a defined path that is certain or has some level of certainty, right? Um, and then I had this other opportunity, which this company could fail tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> right? And again, you know, you're gonna be met with those type of decisions in your life. And I think whatever decision you make, it's not about that. It's, are you making the decision based on fear? Or are you making the decision based on faith? And right. I would encourage people, hey, just lean into that, that faith lever more than that fear lever or else you'll never know, you know? Yeah. So uh, you were thinking wide and aimed straight because you had an initial goal to be your own uh, business owner of a startup. Yeah. And you knew that you weren't ready at that point to just jump into that. Yeah. And it probably would have ended up, you know, you probably would have ended up figuring it out. But because you made this new transition, it made it seamless for you to step into that next position that you knew you were ready. I can resonate with that because I was in a sales job uh, before I before I took a full time teaching job, uh, and I was making really good money. Like it, it afforded afforded our family a, a lot of things financially, but I just I was getting stagnant. I loved the people that I worked with. I loved our CEO. He was awesome. We would actually go hoop together and things like that. But it just really wasn't for me long term. And yes, it was a, a, I guess you would say a step back from from an outside perspective. But it's allowed me to take three or four other steps because of that. Because now I'm a teacher. It, it, it goes right into the club basketball world that I live in and, and all these other opportunities that came from it. But I had to I had to really check myself and you can you could do this for the next 30 years and you can be financially set. But will you be happy with that transition? Okay. It, it took a lot of faith and there was a lot of unknowns, like you said, and there was, you know, sleepless nights where I was like, are you sure you want to do this? And you end, you end up going for it because you just have that faith in the, the path that God is leading for you as well as the path that you believe you should be on. Yeah. Um, so I just, I just think that's so important for people to understand. Sometimes you have to take the necessary steps and not skip any so you can put yourself in a position later on. Yeah, no, that's good. Double click on that decision making process really quick, Chris, because I think, I think that's really important for people. So we got the faith component, right? Yep. And what are the practical steps? Like what, how did you decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to actually make the decision to go into teaching, right? Um, did it look like, you know, going to wise counsel? What did like walking out your faith look like? Yeah, so for me, and I like how you switched it up. That's a great uh, interview technique. I love that one. But uh, no, for me, it was, you know, being, you know, being obviously prayerful, but 
you know, there's, there's a, a, a short list of people that I, I follow up with as far as making big decisions, you know, my mom, my wife, you know, um, you know, certain mentors that I have. And if they, I get all the information first and then I can make a sound decision based on all the information that I was provided out externally and internally. What do I actually think about the situation? Um, and just really gathering your thoughts and coming to a sound conclusion and not just rushing into it. Um, and it sounds like that's kind of what you did as well. Same. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit it on the head and it was my process. The Bible talks about how he's not given us a spirit of fear, right? But then he follows it up with, but a sound mind, right? And so that sound mind can come from sound counsel, wise sure. counsel, right, to, to, that you invite to speak into your world so that you can have that clear mindset in your decision. And I think if you do that, you, you, you can't lose, right? No, no um, doubt. And, and if anything, you have a community that backs you in that decision. For sure. And I, I've, I've never been happier in my life. And now uh, this is what, seven years, uh, seven years as, as a teacher and, and full-time teacher and coach and all of that. Um, and it still allows me to do my entrepreneurial ventures as well. So, yeah. Okay. Love that. Uh, tell me about over, Overflow. So what do you do? How did you figure out what you wanted to start? And, you know, starting a, a company is, uh, there's just so many different things. And I've done a couple different companies. There's just always something that needs to be done. You're never, ever finished, it seems like. But uh, tell me what your process was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got this really good advice from another friend that founded a company a couple of years ago. He said, Vance, don't start a company unless you can't not start that company. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when you come from that premise, it clarifies. Oh, I, I love the double, double negative too. <laughs> exactly. It clarifies a lot, right? Because yeah. I think, especially in the Valley, because being an entrepreneur is so in right now and so trendy if you just look at any ig handle everybody's an entrepreneur right? <laughs> you know um so i think that when you come from the premise of don't do it unless you can't not do it it clarifies your intent it then doesn't become about trying to be on the front page of page of forbes right it doesn't come from oh because this is a really good way to make money because honestly right. entrepreneurship it's probably one of the worst ways to make money in terms of how demanding and how difficult it is. Yes. Right? And so, and so it's, yeah, it's limitless when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a business owner, it's limitless, but it's also one of the hardest paths you can choose. An easier path to make money, honestly, is study really hard, work really hard, get into a big tech company and just stay right. <laughs> for a while. That's a really good way to, to make, to make wealth that's probably not as difficult. Not saying it's not difficult, it's gonna be difficult. But um, being an entrepreneur and the dynamics of that is really, really difficult. And so that was one thing that was really big for me is getting my intent right. And so when I got my intent right, that allowed me to actually hear from God on what he was directing with me a lot more clearly. Right. And that thing was centered around this first principle that my wife had been living since the beginning of our marriage, which was based on this verse, Proverbs eleven twenty four: the okay. world of the generous gets larger and larger. Huh. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. My wife and I disagree on a lot of things. This is one thing that we agreed upon yeah. when we started our marriage is that we want to build a marriage that gives more than that we take right? That we constantly want to be given, giving to our church, giving to our community, giving to the people that God has put in our life. And so we've just been living that out for the last decade. And then all of a sudden, God put this idea in my heart that um, might help productize this principle, which is this thing that we started seeing actually within our own church community of more and more people wanting to give non-cash assets. Mm -hmm. primarily publicly traded stock. So if you're, if you've ever given to your local church or if, you, if you've ever given to a nonprofit, you might've given through a platform like PayPal or something similar to it, where it makes it really easy to give cash and credit card. And that's okay. really how most people give to causes or nonprofits. You even got 
new platform, newer platforms like GoFundMe now that make it even social, right? Uh, so an insight that we got within our community is that there's this whole movement of people that are getting compensated with stock, right? From their companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, but also this whole movement of millennials getting onto apps like Robinhood. So we're becoming a more invested generation right now. And we're holding our wealth, not just in cash and credit card now. And so people now want to give from those pockets. And so we saw this opportunity uh, because giving stock right now without overflow is super difficult. It requires lots of forms and snail mail and fax machines and you know, a lot of outdated technology. Sure. We basically sure. built the PayPal for stock donations. And <laughs> we first built it for our community. And now that we've seen some people within our community use it and have success with it, we're now starting to share it with other nonprofits that can hopefully benefit from unlocking this new fundraising channel. Sure, and are they able to are they able to use those dividends uh, right away once they are shared? Because a lot of times in the stock market, you know, you you'd be taxed on it uh, on the on the gains and things like that. Yeah. So how do how does that work if um, if I want to donate to my church? Yeah. And I want to use the stock market to do that. Yeah. What is the process and how does it all play out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. If Chris wants to donate to his church, he might have right a Charles Schwab account or a Fidelity account or some sort of brokerage account. And whether it's your company stock or whether it's stock that you've invested in over the years, let's say Apple, for example, that's had tremendous gains in the past decade or Tesla that's had significant gains in the past year. If you give that stock directly, what happens, and this is why it's actually so advantageous to give this way, is that you protect those capital gains, hmm. right? And so if you were to instead liquidate that Apple stock, and let's say you were going to liquidate $1,000 worth of that Apple stock, yeah. most likely you would have to pay up to $400 in capital gains tax, and then you would give the remainder $600 to the nonprofit. Right. But if you want to give the stock directly through overflow to the church or nonprofit, you can give that full 1,000 huh. and when the church or nonprofit liquidates that thousand dollars of Apple stock. They don't have to pay any of the capital gains tax because they're tax exempt as a 501c3. Got it. And so it's a win, win, win because you get a higher tax deduction, which means you get more tax savings and you get a bigger impact because more is actually ending up at the church or nonprofit. Got it. That's an interesting concept. And did you come up with this when you guys, you know, founded your church because you wanted to find a different way to, to, for people to give? Yeah, yeah. So a little bit of background. My wife and I um, helped start a church with our lead pastors, pastors Adam and Kira Smokum. They're from Australia mm -hmm. and they came out here to church plant in uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. So we started that about nine years ago. And exactly what you said, kind of in the journey of seeing just our own community wanting to give in non-traditional ways, like stock, we started seeing that, wow, this is actually a channel that more churches and nonprofits should take advantage of. And what's kind of crazy is that when you think about the nonprofit space and you work for a private school, so it's the same thing, 501c3, right? Uh, churches are 501c3s and other nonprofits that you probably heard about, like Feeding America and Save the Children. They're right. also 501c3s. The problem is that because it's a nonprofit, uh, historically, technology hasn't focused in on this space. Hmm. And that's why when you interact with nonprofits, sometimes you go to a nonprofit's website and it feels like it was created in like 1970 yeah. <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know, um, and the internet wasn't even around, you know, yeah. type. and so um, what we're really excited about is that there's this whole evergreen space that is so hungry for good technology to disrupt um, and to be able to unlock resources that that are there 
just not being facilitated because the technology is creating too much friction to facilitate it. Interesting. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, it takes a smart person to come up with that and, and you and your team and you and your wife and, and everybody who's helped out. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, it's mind blowing. It's got my mind thinking of, okay, well, you know, how can we use this for our club basketball program, which is a nonprofit. Um, and you know, how schools could use this and integrate it. I think that's just an amazing way. And a lot of times, you know, people might not want to, uh, give cash all the time. And this is a way that they can just use their assets instead. I just think it's brilliant. I think that's, uh, that's, I mean, you, you, you hit it right right out of the park with that one. That's an absolute home run in my book. Hey, I appreciate that, Chris. Yeah, I mean, what you were talking about, people are more cash sensitive than ever, right? Because of COVID and people are a lot more sensitive to the fact that they need reserves, right? So their savings account and their checking account is a lot more precious uh, than ever before. And so people just think about assets like publicly traded stock a little bit differently. It's just a different pocket. Right. And that's why we call it the overflow. We call our company overflow because we want to encourage people to give out of the overflow. Cause if you have a stock portfolio, you probably are more skewed in the position to give out of the abundance. Right. right. And what we know is that a lot of problems that we're facing on this planet can be solved if we just resource it. Right. right. It's not that there's not enough food to feed the hungry. Because we throw away enough food in America to feed the whole world twice over, yeah. right? It's not that there's not enough clean water in the world to get every human being clean water. It's just yeah. we haven't funded those projects sufficiently yet. Right. So there's actually abundance. It's just, can we create a technology and a platform that facilitates that overflow and abundance of what some people experience to the places that really need it. And going back to why we started this, if I really believe the world of the generous gets larger and larger, if everybody experience, can experience the life of the generous, then everybody can experience an enlarged life. Right. Not necessarily that when they give, they're gonna get anything back, but when they give, they're gonna connect themselves to something beyond themselves. Right. That's the vision, that's the, the mission of Overflow. And a little more grotesque way I can put it in the business way, and I'm not sure if you heard this or not, but uh, pigs get full, hogs get slaughtered, right? Hey. And the, the, the people that, um, you know, want to take too much or, th or think it's all about them and what they're trying to do and not give, like, you know, I think we live abundant lives because we give so much of ourselves. We give you know, not just resources, but the most important resource we all have is time. Yeah. We give our time to so many other people and in turn, it comes back to us, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, even a hundred fold. Um, and, uh, you know, you could just tell when I, when I was introduced to you by, uh, you know, uh, Casey, um, he said, Hey, you got to talk to him. I said, man, he, and I just felt your energy. Uh, so shout out in case you stop for uh, connecting us, but uh, I really want to get into the nitty gritty. Uh, you are a co-founder of Vive Church and the, the Christian, the, the, the Christianity is, 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 it gets it from everywhere, right? Um, and sometimes it gets a bad connotation. I know, you know, being at a Christian school, there's so many different viewpoints from outsiders but uh tell me about your your passion for faith and your beliefs and why you started the church all of that yeah yeah first and foremost a ton of credit really all the credit to our lead pastors pastors adam and kira who really heard from god when they were in australia that 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 they're they were on mission and they were called to plant a church in the silicon valley because when, I mean, I think what would inform the answer to this question, Chris, is a little bit of the origin story. Mm -hmm. So what happened was Kim and I, we moved from Seattle to the Silicon Valley for work. And because we both met in church and got married at the church that we met in, we knew that faith was going to be, you know, a foundation to our marriage when we got down to the valley. And so we started looking for churches and not saying there's not any good churches. There's, there's some good churches for sure in the Bay Area, but after searching 
for like, you know, different churches and we were new to there. So we didn't know much. Yeah. We just didn't find one we could resonate with. Fast forward two months in, you know, one of the pastors at one of the churches we visited uh, gave our information to this couple, Adam and Kira, that were in Australia at that time. And then I got this DM on the way from checking out a church. I got this DM on Twitter, <laughs> right? Shout out to Twitter. We call it the Holy Dove now. Yeah. Shout out to Twitter. And, and they DM'd us and they said, hey, heard you guys were looking for a church. Um, we want to start a church. Would love to meet you. And we're like, who, who are these like pastors from Australia? Uh, but I just hit them back, right? Uh, yeah, sure, let's, let's meet. And so they were actually coming on a trip to check out the place. They didn't know too much about the Silicon Valley, even though they heard from God that they were called to plant a church there. And so we met them at Santana Row. We kind of went around the Bay, took them around Google, took them, took them around Stanford, kind of that area. Uh, made it back to Santana Row to a Thai restaurant and were just eating Thai food, only known them for two hours. And they start talking about the vision that they had for Vive in the Silicon Valley and beyond. And they were talking about young people, you know, finding purpose in the church. They were talking about, you know, not just one mega location, but locations all across the Bay Area where community is going to be at the forefront it's going to be full of life it's going to be vibrant it's going to be people that are creating the ipad and people that are building facebook people are going to find identity in christ and they're going to be influencing the world uh for not just technology and innovation but for really a message of hope and grace and love and we're just eating our pad thai right they're talking about <laughs> all this stuff and then literally just two hours knowing them at the end of that kind of vision pitch, they ask, so do you want to start a church with us? And we were 21. So in all of our naivety, we we're like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, I say all the credit to them is because they had the vision. And I think the blessing that my wife and I are living in is really just saying yes right, is really just following and trying to serve the best that we can and trying to honor the vision that we knew God put in their heart, right? And so, yeah. and so that's really the story from our perspective. What I would say now, because I know a little bit more, at the time I knew nothing about what it meant to start a church, yeah. that, that if you are open and if you are available, we say this at our church, it's not about capability. It's about availability. If you actually make yourself available and open to what God wants to do, God can do unlimited things through your life, right? And so if you just have that posture of humility and openness and willingness to serve other people first, literally God will just open up doors and you just got to walk through them, right? Not saying that there's not going to be times where you have to try to bust down doors and stuff like that and overcome obstacles that will come for sure. But I think God can do so much with just an open, available, willing heart, right? Yeah. And uh, through that, he's allowed us to, to see a really vibrant church, you know, be built in the past decade. Our mission as a church to kind of round out your question is so that people would be awakened to the reality of Jesus. And so really the reason why we started the church is because we wanted it a, an expression of the church in the Silicon Valley, which wasn't common at the time. There's more churches now in the Valley, which, which is awesome. Uh, but what wasn't as common at the time was churches that were really innovating. Like we, we started the church with the message, not religious question mark, neither are we, right? We were trying to lead with relationship. We were trying to lead with, community this this notion that you can belong before you believe man we exist for people that are actually probably consider themselves non-christians right. right you're welcome here like you're accepted here you're loved here and i think from that premise we've seen just an incredible community be established wow uh so many things that i'd like to unpack there but for people that don't know uh vive is 
an amazing uh, relationship driven yeah. organization. And I got to witness that firsthand. I didn't know what Vibe Church is. Um, but this past year, you guys did a whole week at the school. And so we have uh, a spiritual emphasis week in which uh, Valley Christian brings in outside groups or speakers or pastors or whoever, but they're there with us for the whole week. And uh, this, this particular week, Vibe came through, and this is before the pandemic and all that. But the week before, Vibe is coming or something like that, where it was super colorful and just like, what is, you know, what is that? What does that mean? And, and all of that. And, and then I see him set up and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And just an array of colors and a way of, array of energy. I see young people, people that are in, in their thirties, my age um, or younger. And that, in my opinion, is the, is, is the disconnect from, uh, I would say religion or Christianity towards this era, right? right? It's not a cool thing to really be enthralled with Christianity. It's, it's a big separator. And, you know, I see, I've seen that, you know, even, even in my own faith, like yeah. the people that I want to hang out with are, you know, people in my demographic that have the same thoughts and feelings. They may dress similar to me or talk similar to me, but when I go to a church that has a pastor that may not be in touch with that side of me, it, it, it doesn't allow for that welcomeness from, from time to time. Yeah. Right. And so I think you guys have done a really good job and I have, and you know, full disclosure, I have not attended Vive Church, but I'm going to now and I'm going to I'm going to watch some of your, uh, for some of your online yeah. church services as well. And I'll let you plug everything you want at the very end. But I just think that's the biggest disconnect. You guys have made it cool uh, to be relational and share your experience. And what the Bible tells us is, you know, we're not really preaching to the believers, right? We're preaching to the non-believers. Yeah. And that I think is very important because you already got the believers, you already know, but it's, it's important to keep that relational piece with them. But more importantly, people that are outsiders need to feel comforted. And I think you've done a really good job and the kids absolutely loved it. Um, I loved it. You know, hey, shout out to Valley Christian, by the way, that's been like a phenomenal partner in that uh, your, your school is, is really world-class obviously in so many different facets. And so I think that was new. If I'm, if if I remember correctly, new season conference, uh, Vive uh, Valley Christian collaboration, uh, thousands of students. Um, and what I heard, I didn't get a chance to attend, but what I heard is that the students were engaged. Oh, they were, and it's very easy, man. Uh, with with 1,800 students, to for them to fall asleep, for faculty and teachers to fall asleep, you know, in the, in these chapels because. You only have a, a certain amount of time to get everybody's attention, and you guys definitely captured the attention of the entire student body. I think you're, I think you're hitting on something important too, Chris, with this, is that with faith, right, and our ability to uh, kind of redeem the faith for this next generation is yeah. really going to come down to engagement, right? So the model of going to church and spectating has to innovate, right? Because if you're going to church to fill a seat and we're in a COVID season now, so, so that's not even like a thing, but like if you're going to a church or being part of this, really what the church is as a community to spectate and you're, you're sitting in the seat, the proverbial seat and, and you have your, your arms crossed and a mentality of, okay, what's this church gonna do for me? Right. That's, that's when you've already lost, right? And so I think we've tried to flip that on its head. If you come to Vive, like our mantra is, we're going to mobilize every member. Like you, you're not just coming as a consumer, you're coming as a creator. So right. what has God called you to do, right? And how can we be a platform in a community where you can launch into that, right? And so I think that's one of the key distinctions of the church of the future, right, is the churches that, that really realize that and grab onto that. And I know that there's many, many churches that are, are getting that revelation and, and bringing the church into the future, which is really exciting. 
Right. No, I think it's excellent what you're doing because uh, your, your point of innovation is absolutely correct. Everything is innovated, whether that be basketball, whether that be technology. The phone that you had four years ago is basically obsolete. And right. think about think about ten years ago, and the Christianity beliefs have been have been you know hundreds and hundreds of years. Where you go to church and and you hear the sermon from the pastor, you do your praise and worship, you give your tithes, you do all that. But you know, for a lot of people with with this uh, with the short period of attention spans that we all have now, where we can instantly get whatever we want, we go on Amazon right now, we get get the Prime. And it can be at our doorstep tomorrow or the next day at the very latest. And that's what we need from our church. But more importantly, it's about relationships. And the reason yes. why social, social, media, social media is so popular, but what is the first word? Social. And social is interacting, being in relationship. And sometimes we can feel like we're in a relationship and we don't even know the person, but we follow them and see everything that they put out to us. Right. And they're, they're giving us a message and we feel that we are a part of that. And what you guys are doing with the church is bringing everybody in and making them feel welcome and everybody is in it together and yeah. it's okay to be vulnerable and and all of that and people feel comfortable with you guys and um you know i i, I just I, I rave about you and i haven't been there but that was the experience that i got by just being a spectator for one week yeah. imagine what you can get out of not what you can get from but what you can get out of the oh, relationship yeah. with uh with uh with vive and everything that you're doing so that's awesome man um anything as we wrap it up uh anything else that that you would you know want to share with everybody um before we uh wrap it up and then i'll give you on the quick fire hot seat here yeah yeah i'm looking for that quick fire hot seat uh, just, you know, shout out for sure to our church and all of our teams uh, that make it happen right now, because we're in the season of COVID, obviously we've taken everything online. And so we have a phenomenal community. We have a phenomenal team and staff that make a worship experience available on YouTube every Sunday at 930 and 1130 AM PST. So if you just YouTube Vive Church, just type in Vive Church in YouTube and you should subscribe and, uh, and, and get the notifications, then we'll remind you uh, Sunday morning. And seriously, it's not just spectating and seeing kind of a worship experience come into your home, but the chat that we have is pretty lit. <laughs> like there's hundreds of people all across the globe that are encouraging each other, that are receiving from the worship and the word. And so it's just a fantastic place to go on a Sunday morning if you're feeling lonely, if you're needing hope, if you're in a situation where you're having a difficult time choosing fear or faith, right? Uh, this is a faith-filled um, community, supercharged with a lot of incredible people uh, that are ready to, to support you and to be there for you and just simply even just pray for you if you're looking for prayer. So I would we just- all, We all need that for sure. Yeah. All right, I got one final question. You've got a dinner party. You can invite five other guests and yourself. Who are the five people that you would invite and why? Dead or alive? Dead or alive, yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, are you allowed to say Jesus? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, for sure, Jesus, man. He, he, he threw the best dinner parties. Yes. So for sure, Jesus... Uh, definitely because it's fresh. I would love to, to, to have Kobe at the table for sure. RAP. Yes. Definitely love to have Kobe. And this is people that we like haven't had dinner with before, right? It could be anybody people that you have, have as well. Just want, you want the best possible dinner, dinner party with conversations and, and things that will, uh, improve the entire table. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's hard then. That, that's definitely hard. Uh, definitely got to include my wife then in that. Um, I would love to experience that with her. Yep. That, that would be really, really cool. Um, and then, man, good question. You got two more. That's a, that's a, really, that's a really, really good question. Um, it would be awesome to 
to have somebody like a Gandhi mm -hmm. in there as well. Yeah. It's dope to like have dinner. You got Jesus there. You got Gandhi there. Right. Um, I think that would be really cool. And then probably one of the most prolific orators of all time. Um, I'm really big into communication, always trying to hone in that craft. Uh, it would be awesome to have somebody like an MLK. Right. There. Uh, literally one of the best communicators of all time. And so that would be a good start for sure. There would be so many other people that I would want there to, to share that with me, like our pastors and some of our really good friends and family. But I'll stick with that. I like it. Where can everybody follow you? Uh, you talked about the church, but you individually and where can everybody find, uh, you know, overflow and, uh, and you as well. For sure. For sure. Vance Roush. If you just type that in Instagram and Twitter is where I'm most active and then head to overflow.co, not com, just co overflow.co uh, to check out everything that we're doing uh, in our company right now. Thank you, man. This was awesome. I really enjoyed our time. I, I know a lot of people are going to get so much from this. Uh, you're just a, just an awesome, beautiful human being, man. So keep doing what you do. Keep sharing God's word and keep inspiring because uh, I, just, I just love your energy, your attitude towards life. Thank you. Hey, likewise, man. It's so good to, to have a new friend and uh, what you're doing with this podcast is phenomenal, bro. Keep going. And when the COVID ends, I'm definitely coming over to your house to play ones. So, <laughs> you, got, you got ankle braces in? <laughs> oh, I don't play no D. I don't plan on playing defense. I don't. After I get the ball, you won't get it back. So, <laughs> there we go. I like it. I like it. All right. Thank you, my friend. All right, peace, man. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time. Take care.